Many thanks, Rana, and many, many thanks to all of you and you, Katrina and Nana, uh, for this gathering, uh, which is wonderful. Um, in my work, I am often looking with half-closed eyes at the urban world, focusing on buildings with shapes and outlines, but also on the matrix of rules and relationships uh, in which those buildings are suspended. And in contemporary experience economy, that matrix is made up of repeatable formulas or spatial products, skyscrapers, malls, golf courses, resorts, franchises, parking lots, airports, ports, free zones. Uh, and these almost um, infrastructural rules that control these spatial products are not an infrastructure like pipes and wires under the ground, but more like a very visible, uh, enveloping, urban medium or spatial technology, something like multiple operating systems for the city. And this technological matrix is arresting not only because of its wild mixtures of violence and candy-colored fairy tales about Arnold Palmer golf and beard papa cream puffs, but also because the matrix is rapidly 3D printing a new layer of the Earth's crust, and because this spatial language is creating de facto forms of polity. And it's a secret weapon of some of the stealthiest political powers on Earth. I'm inevitably asked to talk about one dominant spatial formula for making cities that's currently circulating around in this global operating system, one that you know, directly speaks to the constitution of nations and other concerns of this gathering. And this formula, the free zone, maybe the most popular contagious world city paradigm that you may not have ever heard of. Uh, it, it is a kind of super node or super bug in infrastructure space, so maybe it's a good way to look at this matrix. This is one free zone promotional video, but they're always the same. There's a zoom from outer space that drops down through clouds to reveal a new center of the Earth. Stirring music that you might hear in a thriller or under the thundering hooves of a western accompanies the swoop through cartoon skylines and resorts and suburbs and sun flares. Um, uh, as an authority independent from the domestic laws of the host country, the zone offers special deals to uh, foreign investment. Uh, so there's a deep movie trailer voice that repeats all the neoliberal mantras of free trade and incentivized urbanism to which that foreign investment has become addicted. Uh, no taxes, no bureaucracy, streamlined customs, cheap labor, deregulation of labor and environmental law. The zone form has mutated wildly in the last 30 years from an early 20th century warehousing compound for storing custom free trade to a mid-century UN promoted formula for jump-starting the economies of developing countries to a market experiment in China. Uh, uh, you need a thought that the zone would dissolve back into the domestic economy, but the opposite thing happened. Every, every program from business, residential, cultural resort wanted to locate in the zone. Why wouldn't it to enjoy this kind of lubricated uh, political quarantine. The zone is the perfect island of corporate externalizing. So it's sort of having swallowed the city, uh, it is now become a germ of a kind of, of an urban epidemic that reproduces all the glittering mimics of Dubai and Singapore and Hong Kong all around the world. So in 30 years, the range of things called a zone expanded from being a manufacturing compound like this, or a macchiadora like this, or an office park, to a skyline like this, a megacity, uh, or this, or this. And while in the 60s there were a handful of, of zones in the world today, there are thousands, thousands in over 130 countries. Some are measured in hectares, some measured in square kilometers. It's considered to be the nexus of every um, global technology and uh, headquartering of every global organization. It's always called sort of clean slate, one-stop entry into the economy of a foreign country. Um, and it's become a kind of self-perpetuating agent of extra-state territory with 
doughy human figures rhythmically waddling along boulevards or plowing forward stone-faced in pleasure boats. The, 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 zones, uh, the zone videos are now making magnificent claims of world city urbanity. Um, the zone likes to call itself a city. And as you probably know, maybe even more than China, Dubai has used the zone to distinct advantage because it's kind of an aggregate of zones uh, for almost every imaginable program and, and most incorporating the word city. So there's, you know, Dubai Internet City, Dubai Healthcare City, Dubai Maritime City, and on and on, each with a different raft of, of exceptions, exemptions, and... Uh, in Dubai Media City, for instance, there's something like free speech for some people, but it, or Dubai International City, Dubai Industrial City, but it's also the same right around the world. This is high-tech city outside of Hyderabad, and I could show you hundreds of others that use that word city. And then one finds also that, that major cities, even national capitals, want their own zone doppelganger that allows state and non-state actors to use each other as brand or proxy or camouflage. This is New Songdo City. I'm sparing you the Seguras, Seguras uh, soundtrack. But it's a double of soul in the Inchong Free Trade Zone, what its developer Stanley Gale calls a city in a box. It's based on New York, Venice, and Sydney, so it has a, a Central Park, a World Trade Center, Canal Street, um, or uh, surpassing irony, Astana, uh, the newly minted capital of Kazakhstan, um, here the capital, supposedly the center of law in um, and place of legal exemption is in a kind of business free zone. So the zone is for me a very vivid vessel of what I have called extra state craft where extra means both outside of and in addition to the state. Um, extra statecraft describes not a, of course, not a, not a post-national world, but a world where the nation just has a new set of sneakier partners and multiple nested forms of sovereignty and multiple overlapping forms of, of exemptions and exception so that the zone's factories or worker dormitories are still hidden, legally stabilized sites of labor abuse that are outside of any clear uh, jurisdiction. And the zone, ironically, uh, replaces state bureaucracy uh, with more and more layers of its own bureaucracy, the management standards that occupy another strata of infrastructure, the infrastructure space operating system, um, address labor and environmental abuse in the zone with best practice acronyms, bullet pointed lists, pyramids, mandalas, and motivational aphorisms, and sometimes you know, funded by the very companies that contract for the factory service, they only provide non-binding, self-certifying seals of approval that inoculate against further regulation. So here in the DACA export processing zone, as you know, the site of the Rana Plaza collapse or in countless other zones that don't happen to buckle under the weight of their own denial. In the zone, you know, the house always wins. And the promotional videos pan across this gray back of house to a synthesized version of what a feeling from flash dance. <laughs> it's as if the zone emerges from its 30 year growth spurt as a strange form of intentional community with color de fountains and faith in golf. It's a place where everyone speaks in Esperanto of that quality management ease there are fantasy resorts and palaces where petrodollars can get away to relax. And any inconvenient people or political ac uh, actions can simply be expelled. And even though the zone has failed to deliver on its economic promises, and even though this supposed tool of economic rationality is a perfect crucible of irrationality, um, egged on by 
uh, uh, global institutions and consultancies, World Bank, the Deloitte's, the McKinsey's. The zone is often bathed in redemptive rhetoric, treated as a necessary signal for entry into the global economy, so that the next poorest country wants that mirror-tiled skyline at any cost. And the promotional videos become more and more delirious and unhinged as the zone becomes more and more contagious. I'll play just a little clip from some of this, uh, you know, zone porn. Nothing is as rare and desirable as diamonds. Diamond Palace attracts magically, fascinates inside and out with its scintillating architecture. The inner design of the palace transforms the image and emotion of the diamond onto the visitor, letting them become a part of the myth of the diamond. So, you know, this is the massive, networked, physical plant, the special invention of extra statecraft, onto which so many nations are now ladling their own fresh, full-throated anthems of another kind of nativism or nationalism uh, in what looks like a, a perennial disguise to further concentrate power. So as unlikely as it may seem, this infrastructure space may be a good thing to think with. It trains the mind to see in a split screen. On, on the one side, declarations, laws, promotional stories about luxury, openness, relaxation, patriotism, freedom. But on the other side, the undeclared dispositions and potentials for violence that are imminent in the organization and arrangement. So it's almost as if it, it could train you to see with a kind of canine mind. You, know, you see things with names, you hear human speaking words, but those things can't be comprehended in the absence of a thousand other affective cues and relative positions between things. The position of the human relative to the door of the dog bowl, um, their posture, their potential for violence, all being assessed equally with the sound of words and their assigned meanings. So, you know, with the, with the sound turned down, it's easy, pretty easy to detect, see that the zone has the disposition of a closed loop uh, that only circulates compatible information and, and when challenged, that loop turns into a binary that denies or deletes its challenge, uh, a contradiction like labor. The violence of the loop, the one and only, uh, is, is not only the violence of the drawn sword, uh, uh, and sometimes it does, doesn't look like war or other darlings of history, it's the violence of remaining intact. And the political superbugs, whether they're zones or confidence men, are masters of that split screen. Uh, relying on fluid, undeclared intentions, decoupling official declarations from dispositions. They're saying something different from what they're doing, different from what's different from the potentials imminent in the organization. But the superbugs that are the most venal, successful bullies, the strong men and the orange-tinted ones, uh, combine that confidence man's crafty talent for wielding irrationality and fiction with an appetite for the fight, um, for, for more overt violence that tirelessly oscillates between loop and binary. They are the one and only, and any contradiction is not only expelled, but also tracked down and destroyed. And not only will they not back down, they're eager to deliver an offensive strike but also masters of the split screen, they know how lies work. They know that telling one lie is a bad idea, um, but telling many lies works very well. One lie calls for reconciliation and truth. Many lies creates a Teflon surface on, on which rationality begins to slip and slide. So in extra state craft, reasonable things, you know, the usual earnest manifestos, master plans, right answers, are easily outmaneuvered by unreasonable politics. And just like telling one lie is a bad idea, being right 
is a bad idea in infrastructure space. It doesn't work against gurus and totalitarian bullies and other bulletproof forms of power. It feeds the bullies their binaries and it has no Teflon. It's too weak. And the designer can hardly hope to be successful without knowing how to play both sides of the screen, considering the spatial change as well as the spin that propels it, the irrational desires that accompany in a, any innovation. But working in this matrix space also inspires an expanded repertoire of form making and political activism, another set of aesthetic and political capacities. So beyond the well re rehearsed um, master plans of the designer are some alternative organs of design. Maybe uh, protocols of interplay that offer not solutions, but explicit interdependencies that unfold in time and that can be agile enough to respond to the moment when they're outmaneuvered. And maybe this art of organizing interplay as a branching set of iterative moves, maybe it's something like being good at playing pool, where you, knowing one fixed sequence won't do any good, but being able to see networks of possibilities allows you to play longer, ricochet, uh, nothing's directly lined up, um, allows you to add more information to the table. So better than knowing that, or knowing the right answer, is knowing how. It, it takes a while and too many examples to unwind the idea of designing interplay. We I work on interplay for jungles and roads and broadband, for transportation switching, for retreating from floodplains, for even putting the development machine into reverse. Um, but maybe for today's discussion, it makes sense very briefly to look into one experiment with an organ of interplay that, again, speaks to this gathering that, that rejects and converts some of the remaindered logics of the nation and its free zones with another kind of activist uh, extra statecraft. The infrastructure space that we've been looking at has perfectly streamlined the global movements of billions of products, tens of millions of tourists and cheap labor. But at a time when 65 million people in the world are displaced, there's no way to move several million people away from atrocities like those in Syria. That's a problem, can't, can't be solved. The migrations are a constant in history, but they're often now treated like a temporary emergency stalled at the edges of the nation, and of the nation, another closed loop with dumb logics of inclusion or exclusion. And the extra state layers of governance, like the angeocracy, angeocracy offers their prevailing idea, storage in a refugee camp for a form of detention lasting on average 17 years. So if the it, it, it's hard not to see that it, it, the free zone is one of the chief nodes for privileged movement of goods and people outside the constraints of national law. The refugee camp does look like its perverse carceral cousin. The migrating population addressed with one logistical solution um, when there can only be 65 million responses. And streaming in the opposite direction, the first global t digital teenage war attracts not nations, but an age group from anywhere in the world to annihilate each other in the desert, uh, accomplished with a cocktail of grisly violence and adventure and puppy love and management ease. This is the ISIS annual report. So sometimes it's assumed that a designer working in this space will simply accept our down, down, normal downstream assignments of revising enclosure within a bad idea, fix up the camp. Um, those norms are so ingrained. But rather than reinforcing the ineffectual practices of refugee management, is it possible to slither between the state and the angeocracy and hijack the powers of infrastructure space to serve not only trade but also migration? If the free zone can exploit extraterritorial or extra legal space to do work outside of a national jurisdiction, can organizations of migrating non-corporate persons exercise another set of privileges? 
rather than conceiving of design as a means to facilitate institutional violence and going beyond the legal and economic variables that are given so much authority, even when they're wildly unimaginative, is it possible to meaningfully contribute spatial variables into, discussion, into these discussions of global governance? So it's sidestepping the orange-tinted one with, a flag, with one flag of refugees. What if architects design not enclosure but also interplay? a global form of matchmaking between spatial opportunities and the sideline talents of migrating, needs and talents of migrating individuals. So in advance of the emergency camp, might there be several other forms of evacuation and passage organized around intervals of time, multi-year seasons of life, um, a branching set of options that are both more practical and more politically agile about arrival and settlement, or ongoing travel for those who never wanted the citizenship that the state withholds or finally bestows. So for some fraction of the 65 million responses, this sort of rewiring might multiply one-to-one -one relationships, like the sponsorships that have so long structured the most successful migrations. It's a ratcheting interplay that can start with nothing, even convert needs and failures into assets once they enter an, into an exchange with the latent potentials in space. So could interplay replace that disposition of the righteous looping one and binary with the one-to-one -one and the many? It's not as if the free that's laughingly associated with free trade uh, transposes to free migration. Free, free only generates another conundrum in which one has to keep asking whose freedom and whose exploitation. Free is one of the favorite songs of the superbug. So might this mobility describe not another freedom but another cosmopolitanism that relies on interplay and interdependencies um, and with deep skepticism how much interdependence safeguards against the exploitation and trafficking that ordinarily accompanies free trade. Yet, however foolhardy or reliant on naivete and countering other teenage adventures of war, could this be a world of learning, linguistic, diplomatic, leadership credentials? Could this passage be anticipated and celebrated? A story not about rejected, the rejected and the victimized who belong nowhere, but a story about those who belong everywhere. Finally, in the last minute, un un unburdened by truth, refreshed by lies and rumors, the superbug can confound the dissent that is itself a closed loop of right answers and ultimate righteous solutions. Because fighting and being right sometimes nourishes the bully with the disruption and rancor that it craves. And it often seems that our clanking left-right politics or neoliberal labels are completely inadequate to outwit these moving targets. There are certainly moments when dissent must stand up and declare opposition. Yet as important as knowing that, knowing what to oppose, is knowing how to oppose it. The interplay that doesn't necessarily declare itself as a solution or a right answer might offer an additional technique that's agile, responsive, information rich, that keeps them guessing a spatial activism of sneakier, dispositional, systemic changes that can be tilted towards different politics surrounded by the same camouflaging bluffs of gifts and pandas and rumors and meaningless distractions and other totemic fictions that are so effective in culture. I mean, luckily, the superbug likes to see itself. So with one foot gently resting on its neck, can we work to outwit and maneuver it? A sneakier David never bothers to kill Goliath if he can use the giant's large size and many multipliers to amplify a change. So the activist who's too smart to be right, like a pool player, you know, can steal some of the powers of infrastructure space and design a snaking chain of moves to worm into and generate leverage against intractable politics. The infrastructure space may be the secret weapon of the most powerful, but two can play at this game. Thank you. <laughs>